That's right, I spent $500 on this mystery bag of Nintendo 64 fan games. And today we're going to go digging through this mess to see if what I got was even worth it or not. First up, we have... Uh... Ugh. Hey! Oh. That wasn't it. Um... Here we go! Ah, some good old banjo fun. Looking up some information online, I'm only able to find a few things about this game. It's supposedly a prequel to Banjo-Tooie, taking place between the first and second game. Logo the toilet from Mad Monster Mansion, got a hold of Gruntilda's magic wand, and used it to make the dreamy depths, aka the world this game takes place in. It was developed by Logo? Man, this person has a weird obsession with banjo toilets. Development began back in 2013, and it was fully released in 2018. It seems like this could be a good one, decent development time, and it's rare to see a banjo fan game. I'm actually really excited to see how this one turns out. Let's, uh, pop her in. The game just kind of boots up, and the first thing I immediately notice is that something feels off. It's been a long time since I've played Banjo-Kazooie, but I could have sworn you start Banjo with a bunch of abilities. Jumping, attacking, and, you know, more stuff like that. This game, though, starts you with nothing. The first time I played, it actually took me a really long time to figure out what was going on. At first I thought maybe I had just forgotten my controls, but after some exploring and hiding from enemies, trying to kill me, I figured it out. In the first level of the game, after exploring the homeworld for a while, there are some Monty Mole Hills hidden around that you can interact with, and Monty here actually slowly gives you your moves. The first level unlocks the ability to climb trees and attack enemies, and that's it. It's not till later levels that you actually learn how to swim underwater, double jump, do backflips, talon trot, and more. That seems to be the main gimmick of this game. It plays a lot like a Metroidvania game, where you get new abilities in later levels that allow you to enter new areas and unlock more stuff in past levels. It's a pretty great idea, but I don't think it's implemented all too well in this fan game, for a few reasons that we'll get into later. The overworld of this fan game is really well put together, slowly giving you access to the eight different levels by opening note doors and using abilities to explore more and more of the hub world. Each level tries its best to have its own unique style. We have forests, beach towns, caves, snow-filled mountains, space, and more. I really enjoyed the different level gimmicks, my favorite being the snow level with an alien ship inside of it. As we near the end of the game, I started to find it very difficult to open note doors. Each new door seemed to demand more and more from me, getting to the point where most levels needed to be 100% complete. Specifically, this last door here, I had to struggle to complete another level and get all 25 notes on it, which was a huge pain. Because if you mess up and fall in this lava while doing these difficult tightrope segments, you have to restart the whole thing. It's very unforgiving. This has to be my biggest issue with this game. There are no jiggies, which in itself is pretty damn crazy for a banjo game. But designing your whole game around collecting notes as an item that resets on leaving a level or dying is crazy. Especially when you demand almost perfection from the player in collecting them, all while making them consistently have to do ridiculous tightrope platforming over death pits. It's bad enough that you make the player return to past levels like a Metroidvania style as you collect new power-ups, but also making them have to recollect all the notes they already did the first time they were in the level is very annoying. Thankfully, after many attempts, I was able to get enough notes to open this last door and enter the final level, which is pretty cool. It has you entering space and exploring the moon and this space station and what? What do you mean this isn't the last level? There's there's nowhere else to go, I'm in space! Well, it seems I was wrong, and space isn't the final frontier. Yeah, when I was playing this for the first time, I somehow got myself believing that this had to be the final level. I don't know if that was due to the fact that I just wanted the game to be over, or maybe I just didn't see anywhere else to go, so I assumed that this had to be the final level. I later did some research online and looked up some YouTube videos and ended up figuring out where I had to go. 
Right on the side of the mountain is another note door, and once again I spent way too much time getting what small amount of notes I could get to open this door, which led me to Mumbo, who gives you a B transformation, allowing you to enter this small hole that takes a year's worth of piloting school to be able to enter. And inside is another level. This is where I gave up. I just couldn't do it. I needed a ton of notes for another door to get further, and this level was just brutal, having you transform between B-Banjo and normal Banjo, flying around with horrible flight controls, and just non-stop killer platforming and bad enemy placement. I couldn't get past this level. I actually came back to this level on three separate occasions after recording other stuff to see if I could beat it and get further so I could talk about this game more in the video, and <laughs> I couldn't do it. I just had to quit. So that's all she wrote for Banjo Dreamy. If you are a hardcore Banjo fan and want something more challenging, I would definitely recommend this, but for anyone looking for a casual, fun Banjo experience, I'd, uh... Just stay away from this thing. Real quick, if you enjoy what you're watching, please don't forget to like and subscribe. It really helps the channel, especially now that I'm working on these longer form videos that take more effort to put together. Thank you for your time. Let's get back to the video. All right, four more games to go. Let's see what else I can pull out of my mystery sack. Huh, nice! A Mario Kart 64 fan game. For those of you who don't know, Mario Kart 64 is really nostalgic for me and holds a very special place in my heart. So, I hope this can give me some more enjoyment out of a classic I love. <laughs> what the fuck was that? Seriously. That's the startup for this fan game, the creepiest children's laugh track I can think of. It really comes out of nowhere. Now, Mario Kart 64 Amped Up is a brand new experience developed by Lightronom. It adds four new cups with four new tracks, new assets, and new modes to an already great game. Let's start by going over some of the courses and what I thought of them and how they look. First, let's talk about remakes. Amped Up includes, from what I can tell, I could be getting this wrong, but six remakes of other tracks, and they all get that special Mario Kart 64 aesthetic, even tracks that were already on the N64, like Ancient Lake from Diddy Kong Racing has had its graphics changed to look more in line with the Mario Kart 64 look. The other remake tracks include a downgrade of Mario Circuit from the GameCube, this one I wasn't a big fan of, it just felt a bit off to me probably one of the few tracks that didn't feel great, and I think it may be due to the range these piranha plants have across the track compared to their GameCube counterparts. We also have Route 101 from Sonic Adventure 2 Battle, which is weird. I wasn't sure if I should consider this a remake, but after comparing them to each other, they are pretty one-to-one -one as a track, and I think it's really cool to have a Sonic level in a Mario Kart game. SNES Mario Circuit 3 is also there, and it's like... Meh, I guess. I'm just bored and tired of this track. It doesn't look great, and I feel like something better could have been here in its place. The last two remakes, or I guess I should say demakes, are DS Wario Stadium and the MVP, one of my favorite tracks, Neo Bowser City. Some of the great bits of Neo Bowser City are lost in its demake here, but it's still an amazing addition. DS Wario Stadium is also fun. I don't have too much to say about it, except that the final jump of the race feels really off. I don't know if it was the character I was playing, but the AI always screwed me at the end of the lap after this jump. More important though are the brand new tracks, and there are a lot of them, and all very clever. I found myself really falling in love with the ideas and concepts that Lytronom brought to the table here. The Mushroom Cup includes Tsumuri Beach and Calamari Canyon. I can't really tell what Tsumari Beach is based on, if anything, but it has this amazing feature where after each lap the time of day changes. You start the race during the day and end the race at night, and I thought that was a really cool addition to the game. Calamari Canyon, on the other hand, almost feels like a mix of Wario's Goldmine and Calamari Desert. 
The Flower Cup gives us two tracks, a Super Mario World track that actually uses cages and pipes as shortcuts through the track, and the finish line is the goalpost from Super Mario World. Like I said, small details like this are in all of these tracks, and I'm loving them. The second track in the Flower Cup is probably one of my favorites, and that's Green Greens, a Kirby 64 track that has so much attention put into it that I couldn't help but love every lap. Even having Wispy Woods here to blow some wind at your cart to slow it down was a treat. The Star Cup adds a Super Mario 64 secret slide level that's pretty close to the actual secret slide, with some changes here and there to make it a better track. And out of nowhere, there's also a Pocky and Rocky course called Kiki Kai Kai Shrine, and it's another amazing course, including music and enemies from the game as obstacles. Plus, after the first lap, a thunderstorm starts and it starts to rain in game, making the course a bit harder to get through. I loved this one. The last cup has, from what I can tell, four brand new tracks. Hazy Maze Cave is a racetrack version of the Super Mario 64 level that has a maze halfway through the track that adds some interesting aspects to how you traverse the level. Yoshi's Riverbed is a Yoshi-themed course, nothing quite special about it. Sandy Slide is a desert-themed level. This one has some very weird turns that hide cliffs and holes in the track, making it kind of annoying to run through the first time. But afterwards, a pretty fun map that looks great. The last and weirdest level is a Glover course called Carnival Realm. This track also has the same shortfalls that Sandy Slide has with some very sharp and out of nowhere 90 degree turns that throw you off the first time through. I even fell for them after a couple of laps. This track wasn't very great to be honest, but aesthetically, it's a pretty damn cool racetrack. And you know, Glover courses are something I've never imagined racing on before, so I thought that was a pretty sweet idea. Now, like I said earlier, this game doesn't just add new tracks, it also adds new game modes as well. Besides the default way to race, you can also choose from three other modes. N64 Coins has eight coins scattered around the map, and if you can find them all, you get a speed boost and a free Starman. Balloon Race gives each player three balloons, and if you lose all your balloons by being hit, you're out of the race. You can also steal balloons by boosting into another player with the mushroom. The final game mode is Elimination, an interesting idea where each lap the person in last place gets eliminated until there's only one driver left. I really liked this mode, but it did drag on a bit too long. Not sure how that could be fixed outside of maybe eliminating more than one driver for the first few laps. There's also Time Trials that have some bonus game modes to help challenge you speedrunners out there. The N64 coin mode is included here in Time Trials as well, but we also have Target Zones, where you have to drive through all the Target Zones before finishing the race, and the Mini Turbos mode, where you're always accelerating and need to do as many Mini Turbos as possible by drifting without crashing or driving the wrong way. On top of all of that, there are also a bunch of game settings to customize how you play the game. Stuff like speedrun mode to verify your recorded runs, and changing what items NPCs use, which you may need to do since it really felt like I never got hit by blue or red shells when I was playing. Speaking of red shells, you can also change how red shells track. And if you want, you can also make it so everyone's stats are the same as a certain driver's. This really was an amazing fan game that Lightronom put together, and they're actually still working on it. This card I bought is actually already out of date. Lightronom has released 2.95, which adds unlockables to the game for completing new time trials and other challenges for the next update. It looks to add more unlockables and the ability to change how many NPCs are in a race. This was definitely worth it, and I can't wait to bring this card over to my dad's and play some brand new Mario Kart 64 with them. Now, what else do we have in this bag? Wah! Waluigi's Taco Stand is definitely one of the weirdest fan games I've ever seen. It's a ROM hack based on a meme that was posted on a GameFAQs forum back in 2002. The meme went on to spread through the internet, creating fan fictions and fan art until 2012, when well-known Super Mario 64 hacker Kaz created a post showing off an N64 cart with box and instructions of Waluigi's Taco Stand. 
He would later release a video showing off the manual and some gameplay before listing the game on eBay and selling it for $605. That specific copy was the only original copy of Waluigi's Taco Stand that was ever sold. And who knows where it could be today. Thankfully, the game has been uploaded online since then for all of you to enjoy. And that's how this little puppy came to exist. The plot revolves around the fact that Waluigi has a gambling problem and has lost all of his money and now can't afford to pay his rent. I have to say I find this very fitting. Waluigi's counterpart, Wario, is known for collecting treasure and hoarding gold, so the fact that Waluigi would be the opposite with a crippling gambling addiction seems quite fitting. Back inside Waluigi's house, we're greeted by his Koopa landlord who says that you've not only spent all of your money, but spent all of Wario's money as well. Jeez. Waluigi, you doing all right, man? Wah! I have a gambling addiction and no one's helping! Wah! Alrighty then. Well, to fix our issue, Koopa offers us to work at his taco stand, and we take him up on that offer. But before we get to making tacos, I just want to point out the details in Waluigi's home. The dirt all over the ground, the bomb bombs in the corner for mischief, his pet chain chomp, the poster of Mario and Luigi that has graffiti all over it, and there's even his tennis racket hidden in the back. The music is also pitch shifted in multiple places to make it just that much weirder than it needs to be. It's some really cool details that I love seeing in these kinds of fan games. Let's begin our journey as taco amateurs. The gameplay of Waluigi's taco stand is pretty simple. A customer shows up and requests some ingredients they would like in their taco, and then you enter a level and need to run around picking up those ingredients. Stuff like beef is gotten from killing Goombas who drop bacon, which definitely isn't beef, but I'm not going to get into a fight about this. Just remember, the customer is always right. There are also random ingredients just thrown around like lettuce, cheese, and tomatoes for you to pick up. After clearing out the line of customers, you increase your taco rank and move on to the next level. There are four levels in total, a green hill kind of zone, a beach area, a mountain area, and a lava level. They're all pretty small and there isn't anything super special about them. Some levels have items like shells or wing caps, but if you're looking for the next level platforming or amazing gameplay, Waluigi's Taco Stand is probably not the place for you. There was one challenging part of the game though, and that was getting some chicken. Halfway through the third level, a customer asks you for chicken, which requires you to grab this wing cap, and, you know, and my game froze. Okay, I'll just reboot and try again, and here we go, and my game froze again. Yeah, uh, this ROM cart doesn't actually work. Whenever I pick up the wing cap, the game freezes, making this pretty much unbeatable. Thankfully, we have the internet and emulation, so we can fix that problem pretty easily. Sweet, so now after grabbing the cap, you need to race to the top of the mountain, triple jump to start flying, and then fly directly into this bird midair. It's harder than it looks, and the game asks you to do it twice. I'm not complaining though, it wasn't annoying or impossible, just a fun challenge added to the end of the game. The last level has you ride a dinosaur around a lake of lava to get the food items you need, and, uh... Yeah, the dinosaur just straight up kills you. Multiple times I had the dinosaur rush me while getting off onto an island and just crush my character and freeze me in place, causing me to fail and lose the level. To beat the level, I ended up just saying screw the dinosaur and burnt my butt across the lava to get where I needed to be. I mean, I can't die, so why not take advantage of it? After completing the last level, Mr. Rent, your Koopa landlord, shows up, congratulates you on a job well done, tells you that you did enough work to pay off your rent, and then you're greeted by this beautiful picture that says Rent Paid. And, uh, that's it. That's how the game ends. It was a pretty short experience. My first time playing through the game only took me about 40 minutes to finish, but it was a fun meme game while it lasted. I don't really know what else to say. It was surprisingly good, and I enjoyed it. Would I pay $75 or more for this cart? No, especially since the cart actually doesn't even work. <sighs> but would I recommend downloading the ROM and trying it for yourself? 
most definitely. But before we do that, let's take a look at the last two games in this bag. Huh. I had a feeling we would be seeing a Zelda game come out of this bag eventually. Now it looks like this one is called Zelda 64 Dawn and Dusk. This is Zelda Dawn and Dusk, a Nintendo 64 disk drive fan game. It was developed by Luigi Blood and Captain CDI. Luigi Blood worked on the technical side of disk drive work, and Captain CDI was in charge of all the creative stuff. It was a group project to show what the capabilities of Zelda 64's disk drive support for hacks can be, and I think it does a pretty great job at this. It's the best Zelda 64 ROM hack I have ever played. A lot of the ones I've played in the past are just filled with random junk all over the place and reuse a ton of assets, but Dawn and Dusk use completely new areas and other stuff to really make this feel like a new experience. The game begins with a cutscene that looks to have been put together in MS Paint. It gives us a basic understanding of the story so far, telling us that there was once a kingdom with no war and only happiness until the west side decided it needed more power and decided to summon a giant dragon monster. The dragon got pissed and burned the entire east side down, and the east and west entered an endless war, until one day, when a priestess of dawn rose and beat the beast enough for it to retreat and hibernate. Afterwards, the two kingdoms now separate into the Kingdom of Dawn and Kingdom of Dusk, the Kingdom of Dawn knew one day the beast would awaken again, so their priest trained to one day defeat it, and that day has now come. Awaken, tiny child. It is your time to kill a massive killer dragon that destroyed an entire country. You got this, right? Yeah, it's kinda weird they went with a young Link for this story, but it's whatever. The game starts you off in this hotel in a town. Running around the town, you can find a shield, sword, some heart containers, and a bottle to help you before you leave off on your adventure. You slowly progress from east to west, making your way through different areas and solving puzzles. The first area is pretty simple, having you solve some torch puzzles and fight some Dekubamas. The other interesting bit in this area is that you get a metal shield that you can actually use as Young Link, which I thought was pretty crazy to see something custom like that in this game. Next is a pretty small area taking place inside a deep forest. There are a few simple puzzles here before moving on to the next area, the Great Dusk Chasm. I love that we're slowly moving from east to west and you can slowly see the change in the environment as we move through the world and you can even kind of follow on the map where we are. We also get another custom item, that's a purple tunic called the Dusk Side Tunic. It states that it gives you heat resistance, but I never took it off and I'm not even sure if it's needed anywhere in the game since I never really tested it. This area also has some more difficult enemies to deal with like Moblins, plus the puzzles and platforming are actually more interesting than the earlier ones, requiring precise bomb throws, using blue flames, and backtracking. Hey, that, that Moblin is back again. Moving forward, we enter what feels like the first real dungeon of the game, the Red Ice Cavern. The first area splits into two sections, one focusing on platforming and the other on puzzles. The platforming room really tests your skills, having you backflip over a spiked rod, blocking lasers, and shooting a hidden switch in a short period of time. It was a fun challenge. The other path has you collect some silver rupees to reveal an ice bridge so you can light a torch and get a key. After beating both paths and getting both keys, you can enter the boss room, which is just a wolf. And after you defeat him, you receive the hammer. After receiving the hammer, we can backtrack to, hey, that Moblin's back again. How many times do we have to teach you this lesson, old man? <laughs> With the hammer now in hand, we can open this door to the next and final area, Dusk Palace Gardens. This area is more annoying than anything else so far since it has you running around lighting torches and avoiding soldiers that will send you all the way back to the start of the area. Never mind that after finishing this you get to the boss room and every time you have to retry the final boss, you need to run through this gauntlet of soldiers. The final boss of the game is Umbratia Dusk Dwelling Beast, and this boss is the most annoying fight I've had in a long time. As you can see, it's a recolor of Volvagi, but with a few twists. 
the biggest being that some of the holes he can pop out of are caged off or surrounded by fire, making it so you can't attack him when he shows up in these holes. This means that if the boss shows up there, you need to wait for a whole nother cycle to finish before you get a chance at attacking him again, and this can become extremely tedious, having to wait for him to go through his attacks over and over and over again. I did learn thankfully on my second playthrough after watching someone speedrun the game that you can actually jump and hit the boss while he's in these caged off areas, and you can also shoot him in the air with a slingshot to speed up some of his attacks. But on my first playthrough before I knew about any of this stuff, this boss was a huge pain. And my excitement when finally killing him was intense. There we go. Ooh, yes! Oh, boy. After stepping into the portal, the credits roll and the game is over. Overall, this was an amazing fan game, and I can say that this is the first N64 Zelda fan game I've played that I actually enjoyed. Each new area was its own little puzzle to complete, and every environment was well designed with custom music on top of that. I just had a blast playing through this, and it was well worth spending my time on it. Well, we're down to our final game, so let's take a look at what's going to come out of this bag. Huh. What is this? 007 Goldfinger. I really did not expect to see a GoldenEye fan game come out of that bag. But I'm actually pleased. Though it's been a long time since I've watched the Goldfinger movie. Hmm. Gives me an idea. Oh yeah! Movie time. Two hours later. Wow. What a great movie. It has been a long time since I have seen a great classic Bond film. But, you know, I think it's about time to take a look at the game and see how exactly it compares to the film. It really does not take long after booting up the game to see and feel the love put into this fan game. Plenty of custom character models, music, levels, and more are already at the forefront as soon as you boot up. The dev lead Subdrag did a fantastic job with his team recreating the Goldfinger movie to a T while still making it a fun game to play, which I have to give huge respect to. The game starts off just like the movie, having you enter secret hatches and silos to blow up a bunch of drugs. We then deviate from the movie after this though, since the next level takes a scene from the movie that's just Bond having sex and killing a man in a bathtub, and turns it into a whole level about finding the lady in the hotel, and killing the bathtub man by shooting him instead. The third level is really weird, it follows Bond after he gets to the pool scene, and is supposed to spy on Goldfinger, and it has a huge open map that's kind of hard to find your way around. There is really no great direction on where you need to go, and if I didn't watch the movie and know I had to find a hotel to spy on him from, I think this level would have taken me a lot longer to figure out. It also only gets weirder from here because the next two levels have absolutely nothing to do with the movie. In these two levels, you have to head to China and track down Mr. Ling and learn about his work on nuclear weapons, which is something you don't learn about in the movie till much later on. Unless maybe this scene is from the book and I just didn't know? Thankfully though, after these two levels, the game moves full steam ahead with great level after great level, that fully explores the world of Goldfinger while expanding on the ideas in the movie in ways that allow you to have an enjoyable gameplay experience. You travel to the golf course to talk with Goldfinger and place a tracker on his car. Yeah, no one will notice that. They added the ability to drive the Aston Martin, which I was really surprised to see in the game. Plus, you also need to sabotage Tilly's car just like in the movie. Yeah, there we go, that's sabotaged enough. There's the segment where you enter Goldfinger's smelting factory and spy on him while he talks about his plans. They include the old lady with the machine gun from the movie, which was a great nod they really didn't have to do. Tilly, for some reason though, has a different death in this game. In the movie, Oddjob throws his hat at her, killing her, while in the game you find her covered in gold paint and dying the same way her sister did. 
All the cutscenes are also on point, with them including the famous laser scene where Goldfinger says, Nah, I expect you to die. And it also has all the moving bits and pieces in the scene where Goldfinger goes over the Fort Knox plan at his ranch while you peek through the windows in the little model of Fort Knox. They even include the final fight with Oddjob, where you have to make him electrocute himself to finish him off. Now, I'm not going to go over every level, but there's so much more great stuff that made me fall in love with this game. And on top of all the fantastic levels, there are also two bonus levels, just like Goldeneye, that are unlocked by beating the game on harder difficulties, and they're based on the movies Dr. No and From Russia With Love. There are 11 multiplayer maps too, but to be honest, most of them are not great, and I couldn't get the second player screen to be anything but pitch black, so that was a bit disappointing. We have plenty of new guns to play around with, extra mission requirements when on higher difficulties just like Goldeneye, and a brand new music soundtrack with some awesome bangers like this one here. These were actually some really good fan games, some more than others, and if I had to rank them from best to worst, I'd probably say Goldfinger 64, Mario Kart Amped Up, Zelda Dawn and Dusk, uh, Luigi's Taco Stand, and Banjo Dreamy and Last. Let me know how you would rank these games below. I'd love to see your thoughts, and for those of you who stuck around this long, I truly appreciate it. And if you feel like it, please feel free to subscribe and share the video. I plan to do more long videos like this, and I have already got a long list of amazing ideas that I want to put out. So don't forget to come back for some more awesome stuff in the future. And until then, I love you all, and I'll see you around.